In 1979, Norris was hired as a staffer at the Environmental Policy Institute, now called Friends of Earth. Here, he worked for the following seven years and was introduced to environmental issues across the nation. During his tenure at the Environmental Policy Institute, Norris noticed the absence of black professionals in the environmental groups across Washington, D.C. This led Norris to create the African American Environmental Association, an organization dedicated to protecting the environment, enhancing animal, human, and plant ecologies, and increasing African American participation in the environmental movement. Norris led this new organization in what would later be known as urban environmentalism, promoting recycling, cleaning storm drains, weatherizing and climate auditing homes in working class neighborhoods across Washington, D.C. In 1989, the African American Environmental Association began placing black college students into internship positions with several national organization, environmental groups. Many of these internships manifested into permanent positions with national environmental organizations and agencies such as the EPA. The African American Environmental Association has also sponsored creek walks, tours of inner city toxic waste sites, power plants, drinking water plants, sewage treatment plants, and conservation farms, all with the idea of bringing together mostly white environmentalists with, with the black inner city residents. Norris participated in the, in the initial meetings with the EPA to advocate for the adoption of environmental justice policies. Because of his work, Norris has been recognized with various awards, including the Environment Magazine Award, the Conservation Award from the National Wildlife Federation, and the Green Room Energy and Environmental Leadership Award. Norris has been recognized by Ebony Magazine as one of the top 100 most influential African Americans, and recently recognized by New York City for his selfless service to the environment. Norris continues to advocate for environmental justice and technology-based solutions to curb our current climate crisis. What I have just covered is only a microscopic portion of Norris's prolific accomplishments. He has participated in numerous federal, state, and local advisory committees, served as director of the Energy Conservation and Transportation Project for the Environmental Policy Institute, and organized a Congressional Energy Brain Trust. It is an honor to introduce Norris McDonald. Thank you, Sean. Um, and I'm delighted to be here in Eugene, Oregon today. Um, as you mentioned, my name is Norris McDonald. I'm founder and president of the African American Environmentalist Association. The last time I was here, it was 27 years ago, right here at the University of Oregon at the law school, giving a keynote. And I was terrified. I was terrified because I had just in that year, or the previous year, gone into respiratory failure in an ambulance on the way to the hospital. Uh, asthma attack and so it was scary flying out here to Oregon because I, I was afraid I was going to have an asthma attack on an airplane the last thing I wanted to do was get on a big metal tube at 30,000 feet and I didn't know about nebulizers at that time anyway I was afraid of having an asthma attack flying out here so I was terrified as I was giving my presentation out here 27 years ago um, so it's been a long time and then three years later I had another asthma attack and went into respiratory failure. So I was intubated both of those times for four days each time. You know intubation, where they put the tube down your throat and it breathes for you. So I went through that. And so I take air issues pretty seriously. That first asthma attack was caused by smog. Uh, my car had broken down, so I was taking mass transit and I was standing out on, on a thoroughfare and breathing in the smog, I'm sure, during the day. And by that evening, my um, lungs had shut down and so uh, went into respiratory failure. So anyway, I take air pollution issues pretty seriously. I, I was already doing that from a policy standpoint, but from a personal standpoint, um, it really brought the issue home. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Sean introduced my background, and I've got a pretty wide background, everything from creek walks, as he said, to heavy duty industrial um, um, participation. But I wanna leave something with you at the beginning of my talk here, and I'm gonna go about maybe 15 minutes, I'm gonna try not to bore you, and then try to leave it open for questions. We have a number of people here, and maybe we can have a good back and forth. I hope I have some thought-provoking things to share with you here this afternoon. Um, the thing I wanna start out with, like I said, I'm gonna start out with it, and I'm doing that because I want you to think about it, and I'm gonna come back to it at the end of my presentation here, um, because I want you to chew on it for a while. 
Blacks do not own any energy infrastructure or resources in the United States. No coal mines, no pipelines, no cargo ships, no tankers, none of the energy resources or infrastructure in the United States. Virtually. There's a couple of little examples people might come up with, but virtually blacks don't own it. We probably all know the history of why that probably is. So the, the particular thing, I want you to think about that in general, but the particular thing I want you to think about is um, should, um, should blacks own a coal mine? Should blacks own a coal mine in a global warming world? I'll come back to that at the end. Please think about it. Think about what I said about the energy resources and, and infrastructure and then the coal mine issue. And we can talk about it at the end. Um, African American Environmentalist Association. Some people are taken aback by that name. Is that some kind of separatist nationalist sort of group? No. In virtually every city in the United States, there's a black side of town and there's a white side of town. In virtually every city. The black side of town is usually on the southern end, down in the polluted areas. So that leads to some unique geographical and sociological issues. In many cases, as you are all aware of now with environmental justice, it leads to a, there's a disproportionate number of pollution sites in the minority communities. Everybody's pretty much aware of that now, and they pretty much accept that. And if you go in and look at it from a GIS standpoint or any other standpoint, and I've studied this pretty extensively, you'll see that there's a disproportionate number of pollution sites in these uh, minority communities. So from that perspective, the African American Environmentalist Association makes sense because we go in there directly without any distractions, without any intimidation to address the issues very specifically. Because it's not as though environmental and energy issues aren't complex enough. Air issues alone, it's not as if they're not complex enough. Let's also put racial issues in there as well. Let's throw race in and make it even more complex. Regardless, when I think of children having asthma attacks, that's a motivator. That's a motivator to go out and try to really get a, get, make a difference from the, from the clean air standpoint. I'm a creature of Washington, D.C. I came up through the national environmental movement in Washington, D.C. I'm an inside the beltway guy, basically, a policy wonk. And so the first thing I noticed at the national environmental level, and this was in 1979, 1980, was that there weren't any black professionals working for the groups. And so I said, well, if I ever go off on my own, I would form an organization that would very specifically address these environmental issues. And some of the policies that the national groups were pushing, I found, were anathema to the interests of um, the black community, frankly, um, such as using price as a conservation tool. I directed the Energy Conservation Project for what's now Friends of the Earth then and um, worked to protect the weatherization program. Once I formed the African American Environmentalist Association, we actually went out and weatherized homes, audited and weatherized hundreds of homes. So I know that very intimately and very um, specifically. So we, we did the green jobs thing on the ground, and it's, that's tough work. It's tough to raise a family with, um, with a green job. I did it. I tried to do it. I had a family at the time um, with asthma. And so we've done that. Well, what, what's happening now, though, the, the hot topic right now is the Green New Deal. The Green New Deal is the new hot topic. And I assume that m many people probably in the room support um, the Green New Deal. <laughs> and, and just so long as the Green New Deal works and works effectively and efficiently, I'll support it, whatever works. What frustrates me as an Inside the Beltway Washington guy is that I've seen the um, um, ends, ups and downs of, of air policy. When the Democrats are in, we get um, a lot of regulations. We, we get um, new source review, and we get all of these regulations. Then the Republicans come in, and they cut them back. And then the Democrats come in, and they cut them, and they put them back in. And so you never really get the reductions that we would like. The state implementation program, the SIP program, SIP. In the SIP program, it's the state program that's supposed to protect us from air um, um, issues. The penalties under the state implementation plan are if you're in violation of the Clean Air Act and every single metropolitan area in the United States is in violation of the Clean Air Act for ozone, if you're in violation of the Clean Air Act, the penalty is supposed to be you're not supposed to get new building permits or you're not supposed to get transportation funds. So if, um, for instance, 
this area was in vi violation um, of the county, the state, you wouldn't be able to build your new stadium out there, but it's rarely enforced. And so from a regulatory standpoint, and being a Washington inside the Beltway Wonk, it was frustrating to me to see that regulations really weren't working because every single metropolitan area is still in violation of the Clean Air Act for ozone. Frustrating, very frustrating for me. So what works? The Green New Deal can get us in compliance of um, the Clean Air Act. I'm all for it. Let's do it. And let's do it right away um, because you'll see on the ground. That's what put me in the hospital and almost killed me twice. Well, at least one of those times was um, ozone pollution. So, so what works? What works in the United States? We are a dynamic society here. I'm glad I live my life here in the United States, just dynamic. I, I'm a, I lived in the suburbs. I kind of hate the suburbs, kind of sterile. But I love America, but we're a dynamic society, and we demand a lot of energy. We use 18 million barrels of oil every single day in this country, basically to drive into work and to drive home. 18 million barrels of oil every single day. Right now, from our electricity standpoint, you know, um, coal is still at about 33% to produce our electricity. Natural gas is, I think, at about 33%. Nuclear is coming in at 20. And renewables, including hydro, and many of you, I'm sure, know these stats, are around that 9, 10% um, area. So in America, we're using up all of the above. Now, I think with the Green New Deal, they're talking about backing out fossil fuels. Well, we're a practical environmental group, and I, you know, frankly, I don't see that happening in this country. And um, I, will, I will oppose using fossil fuels with everybody else when everybody else stopped using fossil fuels. The reason we use 33% of the energy from coal and 33% from natural gas is because you demand that electricity right now everywhere. You demand it everywhere right now all the time and the utility company is going to provide it. And the utility company doesn't really care. They don't care whether it's delivered by photovoltaics or hydro. They want to be able to deliver that service to you safely and dependably and, and, make, and make a profit off of it to the extent that they can. The, people think that there's some big conspiracy where well, they're against solar and they're against wind. They're probably, and I've worked with a number of utility companies, they're pretty much for whatever works very well. And so am I. Like I said, if it works well, let's use it. What's working well now evidently in the United States, because that's what we're using, is all of the above. We're using all of the above. Now, as I said before, the Green New Deal wants to back out fossil fuels. Okay, well, you need a practical way to back out that 18 million barrels of oil every single day to drive into work and to drive home. People say electric vehicles. It's a long way to get to um, electric vehicles replacing, uh, you know, ugh. 100 million automobiles, 100 million vehicles. It's a long way to get there. So from an environmental justice standpoint, what are we looking at here? Everybody in the room pretty much knows what environmental justice is now. It's the equal treatment of people regarding environmental issues. Environmental injustice is the unequal treatment of people regarding environmental issues. And so when it comes within the context of an all of the above energy strategy, and that's what America is operating on right now, how does that work? How does that work in protecting vulnerable communities? Well, what we have done as the African American Environmental Association is we have pushed for legislation to, solve that, to try to help solve that problem. And that has included drafting environmental justice acts. We drafted an environmental justice act 10 years ago and tried to get it introduced, but that's almost an impossible climb in Congress to get a National Environmental Justice Act passed. A National Environmental Justice Act that would have teeth by teeth, I mean a, an act that would stop a project. Right now we have NEPA, National Environmental Policy Act, but that can't stop a project. Only thing you can do with that is maybe delay it because they messed up on some process issue. But it's, it, it doesn't have teeth in it where it can stop an issue. A National Environmental Justice Act, would, from my perspective and what we have written up, and it's on our website if you want to go look at it, would evaluate areas and if there's a disproportionate impact, it would have teeth in it where you couldn't put another project in there. You just couldn't put another project, frankly, on the black side of town because it's already overly polluted. And so it's impossible almost to get that passed at a national level. Senator Cory Booker has introduced um, legislation to do that, and I commend him for that. I drafted um, the, the Environmental Act for New York City, and we got that passed, and it was signed by Mayor de Blasio 
in 2017. It took us 14 years to get it passed. Got it introduced um, uh, by the city council and it sat there and people fought it. It still doesn't have the teeth in it that I was talking about. You still don't get teeth. You get, you know, you get advisory groups and working groups and so you get around the edges but you don't get a solution, something with teeth in it that'll stop a project. But that's better than nothing and it's better than what they have now. There aren't any state environmental justice laws with teeth in it like that either and so we are standing trying to get in, uh, state environmental justice um, laws passed. So hopefully that can happen um, and we hope that can happen real soon. The environmental justice acts are important. New York liked my work so much they gave me a proclamation work, uh, recognizing my environmental work last November and um, that was a lot of fun. Um, the city council uh, gave that out and that was uh, a lot of fun. Let me, um, thank you, thank you very much, thank you very much. So that was a lot of fun. So Green New Deal has been a great, in my opinion, public relations campaign. It has brought the issue back on the front burner. Everybody's talking energy and environment right now. So um, Ocasio-Cortez has done a great job in getting that issue really back up on the front burner and getting people agitated and have, they have them talking about it. And, I, you know, it's probably some pretty impractical things in there, too, but that's probably to get everybody worked up. And yeah, that's okay. In Washington, you need to get people worked up. Um, we get people worked up. Um, we're a pro-nuclear environmental group. I know that's going to make many people in here angry, especially the guy out front handing out the flyer. <laughs> um, and I went through an epiphany to go pro-nuclear, trust me, uh, because... Anyway, there was an epiphany because uh, nuclear plants don't emit greenhouse gases or smog-forming gases. No greenhouse gas and no smog forming gases. I know they, they're the big boogeyman and they might blow up and spew um, radiation everywhere, but that hasn't happened in the United States. Um, so from an environmental justice standpoint, the plants usually aren't in black communities. Frankly, they're in white communities. But since they don't, um, since they don't contribute to smog, they're actually helpful for the minority communities. And to the extent the plants close down, they're replaced with fossil fuel plants, usually in minority communities. So the position we have pushed is, unless you can find another way to replace that power um, with an emission-free source, then the nuclear, plants, um, the nuclear plants are a good thing. Let me, though, go deeper than that. The Green New Deal is an interesting plan, but I think we have a better plan, and it includes kind of all of the above. I'm going to go over that real quickly, and I'm going to try to wrap, wrap up so we can get to some questions. I know you want to probably get after me about this nuclear stuff. <laughs> um, we have a program that we're pushing called Energy Defense Reservations. Energy Defense Reservations. And what Energy Defense Reservations would do is basically take a coal plant and take the carbon dioxide coming out of that coal plant and convert it into a diesel fuel. Now the way that would work is you would need a coal plant that burns its coal in um, almost pure oxygen, probably 90% oxygen, oxycombustion, really efficient so you would get less, fewer emissions. You would still need the scrubbers there to scrub for night knocks and socks, but um, for the carbon dioxide, what you want with that coal plant then is with the oxycombustion, it's burning a lot more efficiently well, then uh, you'd also need a nuclear plant next to the coal plant. The nuclear plant would split water through hydrolysis and create hydrogen for a hydrogen economy, for the electric vehicles we need. So you'd have the hydrogen in that process. It would split the oxygen off too. It split the hydrogen off and the oxygen off through hydrolysis or high temperature steam cracking. So you'd have the hydrogen for the hydrogen economy and the fuel cell, electric vehicles. You have the oxy, oxygen um, for the coal plant to burn to then reduce the amount of carbon dioxide it's spitting out. And then what you have is you can convert that carbon dioxide into diesel fuel, as I said. And that's a process you use the Fischer-Tropes process. Hopefully some people in here are familiar with Fischer-Tropes. That's what the Germans used in Germany to convert coal into diesel fuel to, 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 to power their war machine. Sassol in South Africa does the same thing right now, and I've toured that facility down there. They convert the um, coal into fuel. 
And so all this does is takes the carbon dioxide and converts it into a fuel. Well, um, the Defense Department, the reason we call it Energy Defense Reservation is the Defense Department has a lot of money. So the Defense Department, we would hopefully tap into some of that money to build the sort of plants we're talking about. This would be a big, these would be big, huge, expensive facilities. Ten of them in ten different regions of the United States. Hopefully combined with a, a national transmission grid that would provide the sort of electricity we need with very minimal emissions coming out of this facility. This energy defense reservation plan, I think, I think it get, it could get bipartisan support. I know people are anti-coal and anti-nuclear, um, anti-fossil fuels, anti-natural gas. But the bottom line right now is what they're talking about in New York. Con Ed and National Grid are talking about a moratorium on, on, on new buildings. On, you can't get a, a, a connection to a new building because they don't have the gas because all the pipelines are being um, opposed. So there's going to be a moratorium. If um, um, Jeffrey Bezos had gotten Amazon approved in New York, they, it probably wouldn't have been built because they can't provide the natural gas needed to do it. That's what's coming down for New York and New England. That's going to be an issue. The fact that you can't build a, a, a pipeline through that. We don't even want to get into the electric transmission lines. You can't get electric transmission lines approved in New York State. So if you oppose everything everywhere, don't expect to get electricity everywhere all the time. And that's what we Americans expect. When we flip that switch, we expect it to happen. As an African-American environmentalist group, we have to be very practical. I'm going to try to wrap up here for you because I know I, well, I hope I didn't put you to sleep on that energy defense reservation program. But as a, as a minority group that, that, that then has a, a population that ha doesn't own any of the facilities that produce the pollution, African Americans don't own any plants that spit out fossil fuels. So as that, we need a plan that's going to work for all Americans, but also that will not then continue with the disproportionate pollution being put into African American communities. So it's a double-edged sword. So maybe try to identify with that, and that's why then I put the challenge out about ownership. Should blacks own a coal mine, and I'm just using it as an example, in a global warming world? Should blacks own oil fields, natural gas pipelines, multi-trillion dollar business worldwide that black Americans are not, African Americans are not involved in at all. So should you keep blacks, and this to me is an environmental justice issue. Prosperity is an issue. There's a lot of prosperity from people who benefit from the fossil fuel industry in the United States in the 20th century and 21st century. But the African American community not only hasn't benefited or, or prospered from the economic part of it, also get the brunt of most of the pollution. So I go back to the fact, or the question, should blacks have ownership in the fossil fuel industry in a global warming world? It's a two-edged sword. So you see the sort of conflicts our group wrestles with. They're very complex issues to wrestle with and to try to figure out. And that's why we came up with something like the energy defense reservation um, aspect. Um, as I said, with nuclear power, um, doesn't emit. Haven't been any um, deaths from radiation accidents in the United States at a nuclear plant. So right now, though, <laughs> the job is to try to convince the nuclear industry to keep running the plants. They want to get out of the business or to build new plants. Forget about that. So now it's a matter of convincing them to stay in the business. It's very easy to do natural gas. Put a, put a turbine up put some gas in it and run it. I'll end there and take questions. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. It seems like uh, maybe you're proposing that the minority communities take part in the shared prosperity of dying industries. Industries that are not only dying, but industries that must die if we're interested in self-preservation. So my question is about whether you're more interested in self-preservation or prosperity, if it comes to a choice, 
And if you're interested in both, why not own a solar company? From a business standpoint, it's a matter of making profit. It's a matter of capital investment. A solar project is going to be a very risky project for a small business person. To really get bang for the buck, you're going to have to have a really big project, and it's going to cost a lot. And the regulatory um, aspect of that alone is brutal. Most, if not many, of the entrepreneurs, uh, minority entrepreneurs, and I, I deal with a group called the American Association of Blacks in Energy. Those are blacks who work for professional companies, the energy companies, so I try to have a relationship with them. But it's an uphill climb, and it's, um, from, an, from, a, from a business standpoint, it's, it's speculative that you can stay in business. I was the first environmentalist to go out and support the Cape Wind Project off the coast of Massachusetts. Biggest protest I saw for and against. 300 people outside and inside, for and against. Kennedy was against because it was going to, Robert Kennedy Jr. was against because it was going to mess up the view of the ocean in his backyard. Well, I met with the company that was doing that project, and I said, well, how long are you guys going to stick with this? You've been at it for three or four years. How much longer can you do it? And we said, well, we can probably do another two years on this thing. Well, 15 years later, it's still not approved. That kills you if you're a developer, an entrepreneur. Just the time kills the project. As environmentalists, we know that's how we kill projects. We'll go out there and do lawsuits and do whatever we need to do to, to, to delay the project to kill it. So from a straight business standpoint, I don't know that you would recommend going into a speculative area that, frankly, the NIMBYs are going to oppose you on, the environmentalists locally are going to oppose you on it. They're going to oppose the wind farm and the photovoltaics, just as they would oppose any other uh, project, such as a pipeline project or a transmission project. That has been the experience out there. Yet, today, we use 18 million barrels of oil just to drive into work and go home. You may call it a dying industry, but I don't. <laughs> That, that, to me, sounds like a real profit area, or the big boys wouldn't be in there making all that money every day. And go ahead. You can follow up. And yet, as long as that's a healthy industry, our self-preservation is a failed proposition. Did you drive here today? I can argue. The moment people stop using fossil fuels, I will go with your argument. I don't own a car. The moment people stop using fossil fuels, such as we're doing right now, with these lights and this heat, I will agree with you. But that's not a dying industry. That's what we operate on today. And our culture is dying, and our way of life, our, self, our ability to, to preserve ourselves is done if we keep those industries healthy. Why would you want to get into an industry that must be stopped if those communities you serve are going to survive. Because you and I use them. When we stop using them, I will um, stop supporting them. <laughs> if what you say is right, nobody here should be using fossil fuels. If that is your position, do not use fossil fuels and it will go away. We're using more, not less. We're going to use more energy, not less. And so my point is, if, if you're going to use it, should blacks make money off of it as well? Is the planet going to hell in a handbasket from global warming? Yes, it is. But we're still using fossil fuels. Next question. Where? Oh, back in the back. Thank you. Uh, so it seems that humanity is collectively no more intelligent than a mole in a petri dish because it's going to consume its resource and then go extinct. And uh, so I'm going to ask you this. Is there ever a crossover point where we stop using uh, hydrocarbons or are we just going to use it all up and raise up the uh, CO2 in the atmosphere to 600? I figure I'm going to make you mad now. <laughs> yeah, we're going to use it all up. <laughs> yes. China, India, I went to China. They want everything we have. And why shouldn't they have it? If they get everything we have, you can forget about it. Yes, we're going to use every piece. Unfortunately, there is so much coal out there, we don't know what to do with it. Coal is dirt. It's literally dirt. The Powder River Basin in Montana and Wyoming, there's so much coal there, we don't know what to do with it. It's dirt, and it's going to get used. It's going to get exported to Asia. That's why, frankly, I don't want our planet to die from global warming. That's why we push for innovation, making prosperity through innovation. That's why I came up with the energy defense reservation concept, is to try to do what you're talking about, do something really practical and big, and it's going to be expensive. But any solution to global warming 
is going to be expensive. It's going to be very expensive. But we need a practical um, solution that brings in everybody, that brings in the big oil money, that brings in the coal money, that brings in the natural gas money, that brings in the solar and wind money. Get them all together. Because instead of using nuclear plants, you could also try to use wind and solar to do the same thing you're doing with the nuclear plant to crack the water that I was talking about. So you can also do the re renewables route. But to me, the nuclear route is a more, it's baseload, so it's a more dependable way because that's a lot of carbon dioxide coming out of a coal plant. Next question? Yes. So I really appreciate hearing from you because I admit I have looked through my lens of white privilege for over 70 years. Um, would you support, and I know the Green New Deal is an organic document, it's, it's a proposal, so would you support taxing big polluting energy companies like fossil fuel companies and using those taxes to promote in communities of color and other places the beginning of expensive, I admit, but green projects like solar and more hydropower and so forth so that we could take from the polluting, it's not going to happen overnight, but take from the polluting industries and support the green energies at the same time we were providing jobs and be benefits for the people who have suffered from our extremes. Sure. And I love white privilege. <laughs> I just want black privilege. Yes. And part of that black privilege is what you talked about. I think that's part of the solution to the problems in Chicago and Detroit. In China, there will just be a room, like your living room, and they'll set a table up in the middle of that, and they call it a factory. It'll be a kite factory. And I think you could do the same sort of thing in inner cities, the renewables. I did the work. I know how to put in windows and doors and door stops and jams and the whole thing, and I think that is a good way to go, a huge program. I think Van Jones pushed that several years ago with his Green Jobs Program, $150 billion, I believe it was. I did that through the Reagan administration in the 80s. I protected the weatherization program. Although I am concerned about our debt, I won't get into that here today, but I'm concerned about our debt, but to the extent we could, and maybe not even tax the companies, but somehow offer incentives, maybe there could be something like expensing. Maybe you could draw them in through offering them expensing, what you're talking about, in the inner city so that then they could get into manufacturing. They're manufacturing um, caulking guns and caulk and that sort of thing. So I support that too. I mean, completely, we've done it. But it's hard to raise a family on that. So we need to get it to a point where you can make a living. This is America. You can be pie in the sky, but I was trying to feed my family um, through weatherization, and we almost starved to death. I had to go out and make some money. So it has to work in America, but I love it. Next. Yes, in the back. I don't know. <laughs> That's why I formed the African American Environmentalist Association. What you can do is what you can do. You can, you can go out and try to recruit blacks, try to retain, just do the best you can. Uh, but what I found is it's hard to retain. I, I've seen the professional blacks go into the groups, but they don't tend to stay. Sometimes it can be a hostile environment. But human on human is hostile. Office stuff is, is office politics. If it's different races, then it's a racial issue. But if it's just the same race, then it's just an issue. But, it, well, it is. It is. I got laid off. I could have said, oh, that was racism. But it wasn't. It was just office politics. But if it's a race conflict, then a lot of times it's, it's racism. No, it's not. It's just sometimes we're conflicted. Uh, and sometimes I think uh, they, they get frustrated because um, they don't necessarily support some of the positions that the groups are pushing. As I mentioned earlier, using price as a conservation tool. The environmental community would be happy with $10 a gallon gasoline because that's going to stop people from driving as much. But that's going to mess up the economy. Well, but that's going to mess up the economy. That goes throughout the economy. The economy's smoking right now because gas is around $3 a gallon nationwide. Well, true, with the farmers as well. So damned if you do, damned if you don't. As far as retention, that's why I said I don't know. I don't know. That's like solving the racial situation in America. I don't know how to solve it. I, I don't know. <laughs> Next question. Yes. Hi, I, I really appreciate your um, 
illuminating the fact that minority communities, and particularly African Americans, are the most impacted by the fossil fuel industry and our pollution in general in our communities. But I'm pretty stunned, actually, to hear you disparage, um, to some degree, the New Green Deal and investment in renewable energy. And I'm really um, I didn't disparage that that I remember. Did I disparage new, the new Green Deal? I feel like you're encouraging, you know, you're super behind the new Green Deal is what I've heard, or, or um, encouraging necessarily the, you know, the renewable energy as a viable economic option for people who are the future. So what I want to ask you is, um, given the scientists insist that the only way we're going to get out of this one in the coming decades, you know, climate, um, chaos is upon us already, and we've been told we have to keep fossil fuels in the ground, 80% of them, if we want our kids to have a future. And so you have this huge platform and this wonderful opportunity to really bring forth ideas of the new green deal and bring forth the idea that the fossil fuel industry has to die. And I'm, I'm not hearing you really do that. I'm hearing you talk about you know, clean coal and nuclear and things that are, that are really dead industry. So, Please tell me what what you can tell us today. We're coming here for new ideas and for inspiration about our environmental work. What can you mm -hmm. what can you tell us and how can you lead us with ideas about how to keep fossil fuels in the ground? America is not going to keep fossil fuels in the ground. Neither is China. Neither is India. Neither is Africa. When the United States of Africa is born. They're going to use up all the energy they can get their hands on. So I understand what you're saying from an idealistic standpoint. And as far as the Green New Deal is concerned, I would hope they would adopt our Energy Defense Reservation Program as a part of their agenda. And they aren't anti-nuclear, by the way. They backed off of that. They backed off of it because they wanted to keep Senator Cory Booker and Senator Sheldon Whitehouse under their tent because they are very aggressively pro-nuclear as well. So they backed off of a, a strong stance against nuclear power for that reason. I think what we have to accept is that we are Americans and we love to use energy because we love our little conveniences. We love our cell phones. We love our little gadgets. And we are going to use energy. And we should accept the fact that other countries want to do the same thing. So I don't see how you lose less. Now, people are talking about coming up with some sort of newfangled battery that might work. Physics isn't going to change. So to the extent we do have innovation, that's what I thought I was here pushing today. I think there are innovations. There are innovations in nuclear. I toured the pebble bed modular reactor, the PBMR in China. That's a new sort of nuclear reactor. It uses tennis ball size um, uh, pebbles. That's the pebble and the uranium, the uranium chip in the core. It uses 400,000 of those. That's probably enough to fill up a good portion of this room. Well, you stop the fission reaction with that just by dispersing the pebbles. Incredible technology. So there are new technologies there. I toured it and want to push it um, as a way to do what we're talking about doing. Uh, answering the question here, the young lady, is another part of the equation. I think we need to do that as fast and as aggressively as we can. It's not being done, and how do you do it? I don't know that I want government to do it right now because we're $23 trillion in debt and doing a trillion dollars in debt every year. So we have to figure out a marketplace way to do it. And we don't want to then just tell people to go form a solar job, form a solar company that's not going to make it. When you should consider all of the energy sources if Americans are going to use them. As I said, when Americans stop using fossil fuels, I'm with you. But you drove over here today. Yes. Hmm? I, I walked in, there's enough wind energy in three states alone. In this country right now, we feel all of the needs to destroy all of the nations. And you know what I mean? It's not the current health of our economy. Okay. And I hope that happens. But I hope so. <laughs> you can along with your I, I am. Now, how will that help our car situation? The 18 million ga ga barrels? Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, um, and 
What's happening is wind farms and solar farms are displacing huge number of people from the digital livelihood ground. And this electricity is going um, and supplied to big saw shopping malls, mm -hmm. which usually are inspired by America's way of life. And this is something that we are aspiring. And even if India is hosting, India or China hosting, are hosting renewables, you know, they're hosting that we're adding several gigawatts of renewables every year. But what I see, and I resonate with that, because even if we go completely renewable in, in the future, um, it is the poor and the marginalized who are going to face uh, the disproportionate burden yeah. of hosting those plants. And not to mention the future of renewables, in that sense, Resources needed to run those batteries. Yes. Where is, it, where is all the minerals going to come from? Right. And uh, lithium, we don't know. Don't know. Don't have enough lithium for 100 million vehicles. Exactly. So it gets you thinking. And then when you mentioned the whole thing about New York and Walmart and, and, and uh, Amazon not having enough power to run, run the new store in New York, mm -hmm. is that the way you want to go? Because I don't think the rest of the countries are really questioning those things. And I'm mean, really thinking about degrowth. We want to shrink because we want to We want <laughs> renewables. But renewables never going to fuel lifestyles that we have. Correct. I mean, we do not have American lifestyles. That's right. I, I truly wish that wind and solar could power our economy. With all of my heart and soul, I wish it, they could, but they can't. They cannot be baseload sources. The physics aren't there. They can't operate 24 7. Where? 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 Yes, please. Okay, I'll call on her. Thank you. Uh-oh, uh-oh, I must be in trouble. You got recommended. Okay. Um, I'm a newly elected commissioner of a public utility, water and mostly energy. And the Northwest Energy and Conservation Council says that the, what we should be investing in is energy efficiency from now through 2035. We can meet in the Northwest at least all of our energy demands to energy serious energy efficiency. And I'm not just talking about weather stripping and better windows. I'm talking about on all of our big buildings, schools, public buildings, all of those. And that's where we should be investing. And I'd like to know. I, I ran the Energy Conservation Project for Friends of the Earth. I did that for like six years. I, I did efficiency, went out in the field. I love efficiency. We should do all of the efficiency that we can. But hopefully, if we're growing at a rate of 2% per year, if efficiency is not going to back out, it's not going to back out the need for new generation. It's just not. It should, but the uh, countries are growing. 1.4 billion in, uh, in China, 1.3 billion in India here with our 300 and some million people. We're growing, and we want to grow more. Right now, there's a contradiction between the growing economy versus um, efficiency that you're talking about. The efficiency will not be able to keep up with the demand for our growth. It just, it, it can't provide the base load. It can't provide base load. Here again, just like wind and solar. You need that base load. And unfortunately, I hate to even see natural gas used as a base load source because it's a precious fuel that is good for heating homes and cooking. But not even that is, we don't want to use that for um, base load. And with fracking now, we can. I mean, we're now the Saudi Arabia of natural gas and, and, and um, uh, uh, coal. Uh, we have been for coal. And so we're going to export. We're, we're not going to use less. We're going to use more. Do I wish we could con uh, e efficiency our way out of it? Yes, but we can't. And so if we can't, let's do the best we can. Just like with the jobs here, I think that's where the small company jobs are that the gentleman was talking about. But it's hard to raise a family off of an efficiency company. I tried. It's tough when you're weatherizing homes. Yes, here I hear. So there's a, a, a lot of economy students. I'm sorry, I'm not shouting at you. I'm trying to. Um, I'll repeat it. OK. Uh, a lot of economy students that have realized this endless growth mm -hmm. is uh, actually not going to work. So maybe it's a combination of changing system change where when you've been talking about the economy, that's the existing economy. What if we started looking at shifting away from an endless growth economy to, re, to rethinking, because uh, we can't do that. It's all about finite, infinite growth on a finite planet. So if we change a couple of things like the efficiency and the gross domestic product to a different measure of outcome than endless growth, 
we maybe we're trying to uh, just keep our economy the same as we go forward. We are trying to keep it the same. Yeah, capitalism, capitalism is capitalism. The quarterly, the quarterly report, the quarterly corporate report is, is, our, is our mantra. Well, it's not a matter of me thinking beyond, it's a matter of getting the companies who invest to do it. Right now, the energy sector, it's in such flux, they don't even know what to do, except to turn to natural gas because there's so much of it because of fracking and horizontal drilling. That innovation alone killed us in terms of efficiency and wind and solar when you can get gas that cheaply, and once they start burning it, and once they start exporting it through LNG, you know, um, with Japan closing its nuclear plants, now they have to turn to coal and probably LNG to power their dynamic community. So it's just tough what you're talking about. Um, and like I said, everybody wants a ton of energy all the time in the back, back there. Okay. It's different, but there has to be some waste, even with nuclear energy. So what, so, and I don't know anything about it, so what sort of waste is that, and how can we deal with it in a way that doesn't pollute the entire region? We don't need any reservations like they've been doing lately. <laughs> Which we don't want, by the way, we're poor, and uh, we do own some oil and gas, but the contracts are controlled by the federal government. We'd rather you stop doing that and extracting it and uh, and they try to cheat you out of that out of your coal contract cheat us out of that and we want you to really just stay the hell off our land quit using uh even the waste from from uh uranium mining on our land too which is an environmental injustice by the way just as um the nuclear plants that don't put smog into minority communities in urban areas represents environmental justice for the black community so it's it's a two-edged sword. In the back with nuclear waste, uranium can be, uh, uranium-235 can be reprocessed. Most of the energy is still in that pellet when they um, take it out to store it now on site. You can reprocess that uranium and reuse it over and over again. I think the best place to do that is actually at Yucca Mountain in Nevada. I've been to Yucca Mountain. I've been in a five-mile tunnel. I stood on top of the mountain. And for as far as I could see, no, no sign of life, not a tree, not a snake, not a anything. I think that's where we should bury it for retrieval and also where we should reprocess it for reuse. And we almost have an endless source of power there. I toured the uh, reprocessing facility in France, um, uh, La Havre, and they're already doing it there. So it's doable. It's just not necessarily economic right now. It's easier just to make the fuel virgin. And, and use it then to try to use the reprocessing uh, mode, but the waste can be reprocessed and we, can, we have fuel forever. And there are a number of other thorium, there's a thorium economy, there's a number of other ways that fission can be used properly to power our economy. I think we should do it. Unfortunately, right now, my job is trying to keep the nuclear industry um, in it. When I first went pro-nuclear in 2001, and we were the first environmental group to go pro-nuclear, a plant was projected to cost a billion dollars. Now that plan is projected to cost $10 billion to $15 billion. You're not going to get these companies to do the investment in nuclear plants. You don't have to go oppose them. They're not, they're not going to do it. <laughs> but, but that doesn't help us from a global warming standpoint. Because from a base load standpoint, you cannot beat them. Absolutely cannot beat. So you may clap, but that's not a good situation. Yes? Well, first of all, I want to thank you for being here. I yeah. think, I thank you for having me. Okay, okay can, we, can we stay on the commercial energy, though, because that's our weapons and that's nuclear bombs and, yeah. I mean, it really, nuclear energy works, correct? Correct. And then we turn it over to humans. Correct. That's the problem. Right. That I, that I see from my, you know, from my vantage point. So if you can, if you can assure me as to the to, you know, to rigid regulations 
to be able to call out thieves and, and criminals, manage, managing it, I will be with you. Okay, yeah. But then the second thing I have to say is the question I have for you. I have a feeling that you actually have a solution or a number of solutions that, in your mind. Did you share that with us? Well, I did with the energy defense reservations. That, that's our primary one because you have to um, do that. Outside of that, you wouldn't like my solutions because my solutions are practical. My solutions are within the context of the American economy and what America does. Well, I mean, prosperity. Prosperity is an environmental issue. Everybody wants to be prosperous. Prosperous just like Americans. That is an environmental issue. How does the United States of Africa become prosperous? How does India have suburban homes forever like we have here in retail shops as far as the eye can see? How does China do that? They do that by supplying them with the amount of energy that they need. Now, we need to promote the most effective and environmentally friendly way to do that, like best scrubber technology. You're going to use coal, go scrubber. We can get to the socks and the knocks, we just can't get to the carbon dioxide because there's no scrubber for carbon dioxide. We screw up pretty well for mercury, socks, NOx, and the regulations have been pretty good, except the Republicans and Democrats fighting each other, because now the, um, the scrubber plant costs as much as the actual physical plant. The plant costs about a billion dollars, the scrubber system costs about a billion dollars. So that's an industry I would recommend people getting into, providing components for scrubbers for our power plants, um, supplying India, supplying um, China. So, I mean, that would be a solution within the framework for scrubbers. Outside of that, it's also providing the world with the energy they need. There's going to be LNG export from the United States. There just is. Liquefied natural gas. We're going to export it. We're going to do our best to stop it. I know. I know. I know. But somebody's going to burn it. It's not going to stay in the ground. Same thing with coal. America is going to, going to export coal. To the extent that that happens, we can sit back and cry and whine and moan. Or we can try to provide this sort of scrubber technology that will at least make it as environmentally friendly as possible. I know, in the real world. Yes, in the back, Becker. I saw somebody right, right back there. Yes. Which, which companies? I'm sorry, repeat your question. I didn't really hear it. They're scaling to satisfy their stockholders and their profit and they're looking at where we're going with that and where we're going is to natural gas. But when you look at the technology dinosaur not that way, mm -hmm. whatever that was ten years ago versus twenty years ago, mm -hmm. it has to be more growth. And it's just even far, far more efficient. Right? So we keep on investing in those industries. Isn't that a smarter main objective? Right? Isn't that you know, hopefully it might be, but the constraints to doing that are so high, it's ridiculous. When you say that, it sounds good, but then when you get out there, you have environmentalists and NIMBYs opposing your wind and solar projects. These aren't little squirrel's nests in trees. These are huge industrial facilities that have an incredible impact on the local environments, whether it's photovoltaic or wind. 200 wind turbines is a monstrous industrial facility. I've been to Texas and I've seen a hundred miles of wind turbines. I'm just saying they're huge, they're huge development projects and, and people, my point is that from a corporate standpoint, they're opposed. That's all. These big projects are opposed. Yes, right here. So I, I appreciate the emphasis on black prosperity. Mm -hmm. Wow. And so, with Detroit being almost completely black, mostly low income, residents are starting to ask, well, how can we own this? And unfortunately, there's no easy answer because that industry requires such a large amount of capital that if, even if all of Detroiters pooled their resources mm -hmm. together and tried to create their own electric facility, mm -hmm. they would still come up short. So, my question is, 
how do we promote the lack of parity in these industries that are mostly focused on being very, cent very centralized points of power um, that have typically excluded low income people of color in, in favor of essentially white people? I'm going to take your question and bring it back over here to the challenge I got on innovation. And you said I had some, and I do, and I just have to keep pulling them out of my pocket. I think with that, it would be something like distributed generation. You're familiar with distributed generation, right? Smaller generation in different pockets. And then groups could get together, even smaller groups can do it. Unfortunately, the utility company is not going to let you do it. They hate distributed generation because, oh, I hate it, I hate it. All utilities hate it because it takes control away from them. So it's distributed generation could do what you're talking about, heck, get some of the little knucklehead drug dealers to pull their money and put up a little generation plant, you know, get a jet engine somewhere and feed it, you know. Yes, it's possible to do that sort of innovation, but you're not going to be able to put a wind or solar in Detroit, Detroit, but you could put distributed generation where you start chipping away at that rate increase. That 30% rate increase is a backbreaker for a poor family, but distributed generation brings the control back into back into those. So that's the sort of thing we would like to push. And we have tried to push that. But we're really, really small. And we, I wish we had big money like, like the Nature Conservancy. They have $6 billion a year. I'd be doing that. Thank you. Yes. OK. <laughs> there's another innovation. There's another innovation for you. Next question. Yes, in the back. One word hasn't been mentioned, and that's population growth. Oh boy. <laughs> and uh, I remember when the men first discovered what was in air quality. I go way back, and the wives would all say, "Well, you know, I never thought of that." Well, it turned out that the women could see that far side. And it's going to continue to go up. And it's going to continue to go up. We're going to grow. Yes. Uh, I did work on a gas development as a current. So this is very concerning to me mm -hmm. because we are being sacrificed in the health of our people. Mm -hmm. We've seen leukemia cases and concerns and lost people because of that. So for me, I really need the entire world to get engaged in the discussion to change because you're promoting more oil and gas development has given me more wealth. And all, more of our people are being sacrificed because of this. We all have to change the way energy is being consumed and do every step to reduce the emissions that are happening. But if you're going to go and do this, you better be promoting every one of these processes. Protect the human health of the people who live where oil and gas or energy development is going to occur. I hear you. My son inherited asthma from me as I inherited asthma from my father. And if I was in a neighborhood that was inundated by air pollution or toxic waste, I'd move. I know, I know that's heresy. I know that's heresy. But I tell you what black people did in 1910 and 1920 and 1930 when racism was the biggest threat as a terrorist acts, moved into tens of millions, got out of there, packed up their little cardboard suitcases and left because the environment was so hostile. I'm not going to sit and wait for my son to get a more severe asthma or a cancer and then start whining about what the refinery did across the street. I'm saying we're practical. Do something about it. Move. Yes. There is no way. Move. I was thinking about the 10-year uh, timeline of the human by the ICC. Mm -hmm. And thinking, you know, at least what I used to hear was the timeline for getting a new nuclear reactor ah. up and running. It's about 10, 12 years. Mm -hmm. Okay, 
okay, so there's this national defense project. I mean, it seems like, okay, the fossil fuel industry has been set the table for more than 100 years. Mm -hmm. And what's your question? And so my question is, it's so audacious to build these 10 nuclear power plants mm -hmm. without our country over the next 10 years. Why not be audacious about creating a whole new transportation that, that will allow us to survive? I wish we could do that. I do wish, but what's going to replace our national highway system that we invested in over the 20th century to build? Uh, envy of the world. What's going to replace the internal combustion engine? What's going to replace that technology where we use 18 million barrels of oil every day? It would take just as long to back those out um, with electric vehicles. I mean, I think you'd back out a certain number over 10 years to back out, um, uh, uh, what, 100 million vehicles. It's just tough. It's just people aren't going to run out and buy them. And then the gentleman mentioned, where are you going to get the precious metals for all of the batteries? It's just not out there to provide that for let's say 500 million vehicles even for China, India, and the United States. So I hear what you're saying, but in the real world, it's, not, it's just not, I don't see where it's practical. The best we can do is, is make these vehicles, and trust me, I was out there in the 80s against the Reagan administration protecting automobile fuel economy standards, corporate average fuel economy standards. That's the sort of thing we can do. That's the sort of thing I've done, so I know what you're talking about. Let's just use these resources as, as efficiently and as environmentally friendly as we can. Yes. of settler colonialism and capitalism and, and growth and the capital. And um, as much as I respect your perspective in coming here, and, and I want to thank you for coming to the University of Oregon and Eugene, Oregon, to this pretty um, radically and environmentally charged conference and, and presenting your um, opinions, my question to you, though, is as young people are disproportionately still in effect climate change right now, and as we know that these effects will be exacerbated <coughs> and only worsen in the future for my generation and all the younger generations to come, how are you considering the voices of the youth and the needs of the youth? Because I'm not only interested in prosperity, but posterity, and, and the very serious question of, am I going to have a, a climate system, a, a land base, a water source that I will be able to raise my family on and I as a young person will be able to live on. So I'm just wondering, in your advisory council, in your, uh, amongst your team, what are the voices of the younger generation to not continue, not talking about the future and ingraining the systems that, to be frank, I think were a mistake from the beginning, the systems that only hurt and oppress people on the planet, not continuing forward with that vision and amongst the systems that already exist, but actually listening to the needs of the young people who don't want to participate in the systems anymore. Right. My son is 27 years old. He's been for me, once I'm no longer doing this, and he's been at my, I, I got full custody of him when he was two, and he has been with me. He's been out to plants and everything, everything with me. I think what we can do is educate the younger generation to the practical aspects of our situation, the practical aspects of uh, getting a, a balancing a $500,000 home mortgage and two car notes, and two kids in college with our global warming concerns. And I think part of that, let me ask a question. What is the danger of global warming? How and who is it going to hurt and where? How so? Very specifically. Hotter? It's hotter, but OK. Uh, it's Wait a minute, wait a minute, right here is what I'm getting to. We have two cities moving because of ocean. Yeah, right, well. Okay, but let me get to the specific here. I think one of the big things is, is sea level rise. Well, before that, we're all going to die because we're going to have any freaking water anyway. Because, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you laugh, but food and water security, the nation becomes ungovernable. Okay, let me, let me speak. Let, 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 let me speak. No, the reason I laughed is because... There, well, but there's plenty of water in the ocean, and you can purify water through desal. That's what we're doing in California. 
I live in California. Believe me, I live on an island. That's how. Not the aquifer, the ocean. We've got an ocean right over there. We have an ocean, and you can you can desail. Well, let me get back to the question. One thing with young people and a practical solution is that make start making plans for sea level rise. Amtrak along the East Coast, I mean, I've been from Washington to New York all the time. You're going to have to move it. The refineries are right down there on the coast as well. Manhattan, <clears throat> lower Manhattan, right down there. All of that's going to have to be replaced. That's the point I was trying to get to with you. Start um, with the adaptations we need to have our society where it can operate effectively and efficiently. And there are all kinds of opportunities to do that, but we can't chase pipe dreams that aren't going to work because it's going to make the situation worse. Yes, follow up. I think in your specific situation, you should probably uh, share many of the components of the Green New Deal with the young people you're talking about. Next question. Yes, in the back. What policies do you think can most effectively promote distributed generation and the ownership of distributed generation assets by communities that have historically been most affected by the traditional fossil fuel? I think maybe um, allowing for expensing of the, of the facilities. That every component <laughs> by the government, that is, that you can write off any expenses related to the yeah, yeah, still, but at least you're going to get the investment in the distribute generation. Then, how do you feel about the companies that are offering, for example, that they will put solar panels on the wall? Oh, but that you use to get that metering for Yeah, see, that's tough um, in, a, in a large scale. Because of the nature of solar, you can't have shadows coming over it. You got to be careful when you have outages that you have a switch that turns it off so you don't electrocute workers. That each rooftop piece is really complex. You got to have a computerized where when it's offline, you have backup and you're going to have to have backup. What are you going to back it up with? It's usually going to be a fossil source. So that's a tough uh, road for the utilities, and that's why they're not really doing it. I mean, New Jersey, if you go to New Jersey, they've done it, they've done it big time there. And we, I think we should put photovoltaics everywhere we can and, and hook it up to the extent we can, but not to where it then compromises the integrity of the grid. Yes. I'd like to suggest a couple of innovative renewable alternatives. Okay. The 18 million barrels of oil here. Okay. One would be oil from algae. You can, you can create algae from your, your power plants. It'll eat up the CO2. You can use the nitrogen from sewage plants or from feedlots to grow that algae. You can create like a million gallons per acre if you have a photobioreactor. And it doesn't have to use good farmland or clean water. Okay. The other thing is DME, dimethyl ether. <laughs> dimethyl ether takes the methane that's escaping from all of our, our fracking wells and combines it with ethanol, and it's 96% cleaner than diesel. <laughs> it can burn, burn in any diesel vehicle without any modification, and it's much more cost effective. I like that second one. That sounds real good. I like those sort of um, biofuels and synfuels um, alternatives. So, and this provides an entrepreneurial path as well if you can make a go of it. Where? Over, over here, yes. As long as the government is controlled by the corporations, none of it's going to happen. So that's where it starts. And it starts with capitalism, so called corporate welfare, and it starts with uh, corrupt government. 
Yeah, it's too bad with the government, but we keep electing the same Congress people over and over and over, and it really is Congress, right? Same thing. Over yeah. And over and over. Right, it's the same thing. Thank you for yes. 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 I have a similar thought. Um, we haven't talked about the elephant in the room, so to speak, and that's capitalism. And something like the Green New Deal not only asks for different energy sectors, but the way things are established, like Medicare for all people and a, a minimum wage that is a livable wage so people wouldn't have to worry so much about I can't start a small industry because I still have to pay for corporate controlled health care and for minimum wage. So maybe that's a focus that would be so lovely if a leader, such an intelligent person as yourself, might be putting that message out if you were so inclined. You're talking about socialism, right? Okay, but that's still government. I mean, we're still talking government. So, and that's the problem is if you have government control and operation, as you said, with the corporations. I'm really sorry, but I think it's totally unfair to say people, tell people to move, who <laughs> have to move and move and move from their very... I, I think it's unfair, too. I absolutely think it's unfair. But I'm saying that being practical, you don't want to sacrifice your health or the health of your children to make a point. Yes. So the United States has the largest greenhouse gas emissions per capita of any nation of the world. Like you said, China does? The United States, they have the largest greenhouse gas emissions per capita. Okay, yeah, yeah. With all this prosperity, yeah, 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 yeah. our lifestyle, our economy, mm -hmm. it has a lot of environmental consequences. It's right. not sustainable. How can you promote spreading our way of life around the world when we're in the midst Crisis that is spreading our very way of life. How do we keep spreading this unsustainable, the unsustainable lifestyle to the billions of people? Eh, because it's so wonderful. Well, it's I said it's so wonderful. Your kids won't survive your success. They'll figure it yeah. out. You are playing oh Russian God. roulette with your kids. We, we, we are playing Russian roulette. I absolutely agree with that. But I think you're overlooking the great benefits of American society. America has produced a society like no other in the history of humanity. They spread the wealth out better than any other society out here. And well, yes we have, yes we have, and people are living pretty well. Can we, can we make it better? Sure we can. I'm here if people want to stay in debate this a little bit more, but I guess we need to wrap it up according to management. So can I, may I take one more question? One more question, right here. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Uh, so, I hear a, a lot of conflict that seems to be like a conflict between the very particular idealistic vision of a lot of people there and your commitment to a certain pragmatic lens on where we are right now. And I would be very curious and would to hear, like, is there a vision of the future that guides you? And what does your vision look like that you are working towards? Wow. It's a pretty ugly vision. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a vision of, of adaptability. It's a vision of adapting to the ugly side of our energy use. Be global warming. Unfortunately, global warming is a human issue that's beyond human capability to manage. Temperature is going to go up. So we have to adapt to that somehow. And I agree with you. I wish with all my heart and soul that we could reverse that trend. And I'm willing to support anything that will work to do that. But what I see now on the practical side is we want, to, we want more. Every woman in here is born with every egg they're ever going to have. They have their great, 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 great grandchildren inside. Uh, what about the toxic effects? Follow oh, oh, yeah. 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 Follow up, follow up question. No, I Okay. Yes, in the back. Last question, last, last question. So, I, I think you put forward some interesting and plausible ideas, mm -hmm. and I'd like to consider them and examine them. But of course, I always want to know the source of those ideas. So I wonder if you could tell us if you've ever received any money or travel expenses from either the nuclear industry or the coal industry. Not the coal industry, no. Uh, the nuclear industry did finance our trip to China to visit the Pebble Bed Modular Reactor. That's a three thousand um, dollars. I sure wish they would fund us. I want them to fund us. 
I've asked them to fund us. I'd take a million dollar check right now if they would write it because I could do better work. Trust me, I'm poor. All right, thank you very much for coming out. I appreciate it and I had fun.